Right now we're going to talk about Osprey and we're going to talk about union busting. And I have as my guest on my left, I have David, and then we have Vern over here on my far right, and Eddie on my left here. And I take it you are all either present or past uh, employees of Osprey. And what does that stand for? Um, Oregon? It's Oregon uh, State Public Interest Research Group. Um, and um, it's a uh, Basically, Osberg and Environment Oregon. I mean, just to, to clarify, Environment Oregon's another group. Yeah, it, it gets it gets a little convoluted. We uh, we work for the Telephone Outreach Project, which is uh, their um, it's a for the fund for the public interest, and the fund is uh, basically a third party nonprofit that does uh, fundraising, membership services for, for other groups for other groups through right. the environment groups throughout the country. Uh, well, like it's country Minnesota. Then. Yeah, it's a national thing. We actually call for several states. Oh. And um, also the PERG groups throughout the country. Um, so Osberg, Co-PERG, right. New York PERG, Mass PERG. We call for PERGs and environment groups across the country and a couple other groups like uh, the National Environmental Law Center, um, the uh, Environmental Action, Environmental Action um, uh, what's the, um, uh, the jobs one? Fair Share Alliance. Fair Share Alliance. So there's a couple other groups that we call for. The Fund for the Public Interest is a fundraising arm of the Fund for the Public Interest Network, which includes mostly the PERGs and the environment groups mm -hmm. and their friends. Um, and so we do fundraising for them. We call members who have been contacted usually by canvassers, either on the street or door to door folks who have gone and talked to them and said, hey, like we're working on these issues. Uh, we've got activists who are advocates who are lobbying to push for usually legislation um, on progressive issues. So like the PERGs, right now they're working to close corporate tax loopholes. They're working to overturn Citizens United. They're working on some really awesome stuff. The environment groups, they do great work too. They're working to uh, fight for solar power. They're working for uh, extending uh, subsidies for wind energy. Um, they're working to uh, you know, and subsidies for oil and coal. So, th you know, they're doing a whole bunch of really good stuff. And we call their members, the people that have supported them in the past, and we say, hey, like, we're still doing good stuff. You should keep supporting us. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, Ed, you, you get on the phone there. Eddie, is it Eddie? Yeah, Eddie. Eddie yeah. And uh, so you have to wear a lot of hats then. I mean, you got to be able to talk about all these different issues. Exactly. So it isn't just, you know, looking in front of something and talking about the same thing all day. Mm -hmm. Right. Most of us are on the phone for eight hours uh, a day and we roll campaigns. So, you know, starting typically in the East Coast and then as the ship develops moving west. So we roll over campaigns. So you're right. We have to wear many different hats and kind of jump into different campaigns as we move throughout the day for sure. And, and most of most of the I will say the group supporters across the country, just depending on the different groups, the pretty educated people. Um, they, they care about these issues deeply. The That's people that you they, call. Yeah. Exactly. People we call. They, they really care deeply about these issues. They're very intelligent, uh, educated people. Well, they're so putting money out. So yeah, exactly. So you, you really do have to deeply, deeply understand what these issues are about. Um, otherwise, you're just not successful at it. Um, and the groups aren't successful. I mean, so they really do rely on us for, to, to self-educate in a lot of ways mm -hmm. to, uh, to do, be able to do job, the job well. But up until just recently, the folks that were doing the phone calling here or in what, Massachusetts and Colorado, these different places you mentioned, were not union. And there has been a move to be a union recently. And I understand in L.A. they formed a union, so they closed the shop. Yeah. So there has been an ongoing move to prevent the unionizing. Mm -hmm. And why is that? They pay you guys pretty good wages, don't they? Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, it's, it's no, none good. of us are getting rich. Yes. I mean, uh, you basically, uh, you start at minimum wage and, and you top out at about uh, fourteen fifty an hour pl plus bonuses. So, you know, you... For a part-time job, it's pretty cool. It's not bad. I mean, I, I have... It allows I'm, you to leave, you keep your lifestyles right. going. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a single totally father with two kids. And, in Southeast Portland yeah. that way. And, and I've, I've been able to do... Okay. I mean, I, 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 no one's getting rich at it, but, you know, everyone who works for the fund, everyone who does this work believes deeply in these causes. Otherwise, but we what we're fighting it. for isn't higher wages. Like, mm -hmm. that's not our concern. Right. Like, if it was about money, this would be a totally different battle. Like, we're, we're there because we believe in the causes. Like, we're fighting for this stuff because we believe they're doing good work and we want it to happen. But what we're fighting for is job security, wage stability. Like, you can actually have 30% of your pay cut in a day. Like, you can go from 1450 to 950 
Like that's 30% of your pay if you're raising two kids on that wage. Like that's gonna change that's how you're paying definition of and job insecurity. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. And like just cause in a grievance procedure so that like you can't just fire people cause you feel like it. So we're looking mm-hmm. for a little bit of respect. We're looking for some stability for people who have proved that they can do the job because not everybody can. And the folks that have proved that they can should earn a little respect. There's people that have been there for 10 years that have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the company and you know they're gone in two weeks if they miss their quota by twenty dollars like Mm. that's just completely insane the very story of uh, cortina robinson who was one of our original negotiators uh she when we first voted on uh, october 12th of 2011 to form the union um there were uh there shortly after that a vote to elect uh, four negotiators um, and among um, the among the people who um, work there uh, exactly among the bargaining unit and um, uh, Chris Humbard uh, Mike Schultz myself and Cortina Robinson were elected um, Cortina's exact story was you know she'd been there for f- in, with the fund in various capacities on the telephones on um, uh, she was a canvas director for a short while and a um, single mother that uh, after nine, nine and a half years, she was the top caller in the nation two for two years, years in a row. And uh, she was fired. She missed her quota by $40. You know, that's ridiculous. I mean, there's just no loyalty. That to sounds like you really need a union. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the truth is people believe enough in what we're doing for the, f- for the fund and for the different member groups that if we didn't feel... If we, and if there, if we felt there was any other recourse to deal with this, because these these issues that we are fighting on in the contract um, negotiations were things that have been brought to directors, been brought to the national. Um, with you should do this better, and, uh, and we were consistently ignored. Happened before. And so this mm-hmm. is this is what you do if management ignores you. You have to you have to vote. You have to form a union. In this policy that uh, David and Vernon are referencing, it's called ultimatum. Our uh, union representative, Mel- Madeline Elder, president of the uh, CWA local here. Uh, Communication Workers of America. That's mm-hmm. right, yeah. Um, it's called Ultimatum, and she jokes that um, there are more corporate policies down the street over the hill at the Nike headquarters. Uh, basically, if you are below quota for one week, you have the next uh, additional week to be above quota, and if not, you are terminated, regardless of how much time, money, energy that you've given the company. So, for instance, Cortina. Someone uh, David is mentioning, uh, she'd been there close to a decade, raised almost half a million dollars for this organization. She was placed in ultimatum before she went on vacation to bring her son back east to family. She came back on ultimatum. She was $45 below quota for that second week while she was on ultimatum, so she was terminated. It's very black and white. And that's one of the things that we're working to change because we just don't feel that's right. There's no dignity in that. Well, I mean, we're, we're, this is the 21st century. I mean, what job are you two weeks away from being fired, regardless of how much time you spent there, regardless of how uh, effective you are at the job, whether you've proven that you can do it, which she, sh- she certainly had. What, what job are you two weeks away from being fired at, in mm-hmm. this century? I mean, it's, it's just, it's Machiavellian. It's ridiculous. Well, and I mean, it's a skill, right? Like having years put into the company actually means a lot. People that are there for a long time do it better than people that are coming in brand new. And you can look at their retention rate. Like they go through new hires, like they go through pieces of paper. Like it's it's kind of a meat grinder. Like they hire new people. We're going through a hiring spree right now. <laughs> like McDonald's or something. <laughs> yeah, it's just they yeah. churn through new kids. Like their, their idea is that like, oh, hey, like, you know, like kids that are, uh, you know, in college or whatever, it'll be a part time job for them for maybe the summer. Um, and if that's the only sort of people that were hiring and they were totally okay with people just sort of fumbling around on the phones for a couple weeks and getting fired, then I guess like they can play that way. But that's kind of how it runs is, you know, you bring people in, not all of them know, you know, about all of the different causes that we're working on. Like who all knows about fracking in North Pennsylvania and, you know, wind Keystone. power in Colorado. Keystone. And, and, mm-hmm. Right. And so, mm-hmm. so there's a whole bunch of different issues that are going on. You have to be able to pick it up quick and you have to be able to talk to people and not everybody can do that. So there's a lot of folks that come in that, you know, are excited about the issues and their heart is in the right place and they really want to do it. Um, but the standards are high and they move out really quick. And so somebody that's been there for, you know, a year, two years, three years, 
they've proved that like they can do this they can talk to people they can keep people engaged they can bring people back into their causes and remind them hey like we're really fighting for something that matters and we're going to keep doing that and it takes experience to be able to do that for a long time but there's there's no respect for that at all like they're mm-hmm. they're just a, a solid machine and they're gonna replace their parts when they get worn out that's well, that all sounds really machine. logical so why would the management take the uh the tack that they're taking um is it to say actually money? yeah i mean vernon actually wrote a really interesting piece uh we've spent a lot of time um, uh, trying to get inside the mind of, of the fund and why are they fighting this so hard? Why have they consistently fought union in the past? Um, and I mean, uh, let's be totally fair. There are a lot of progressive organizations that really are, are very pro-union right up until it happens in their backyard, and they don't want that. Mm-hmm. So, so the fund's not alone in this. Um, and um, in the in the past, whether it was the uh, the um, organization effort that happened in LA in 2005, I believe it was, um, that, that ended up in a, uh, basically them shutting down the center and uh, um, in a class action lawsuit, uh, which the fund lost, um, or w- whether we're talking about uh, just what they've been trying to do with us, you know, dragging us out in negotiations. Um, I mean, really, negotiations. negotiations are a farce. I mean, they, 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 we've only ever made real progress on things that don't matter. I mean, things that just are, I mean, we, we spent probably a combined out, uh, time, six hours, um, actually dealing with uh, a direct deposit. Yeah. I mean, it's but, a given. But it's so if, given. The, if the question that's, is That's, that's like, gonna save you money, it's good for us. Why would we spend six hours arguing this? And if the question is, why are these guys deal, digging their heels in? A lot of it comes down to their image of themselves. Like they started, um, back in the 70s as a completely volunteer organization. They're, you know, a bunch of student volunteers. Ralph Nader did a speaking tour. He really inspired a whole bunch of people. And the Perks got set up in the wake of that um, to fight for consumer issues. We got to stand up to big corporations who have, you know, million dollar lobbyists that, you know, they, they can spend, you know, big corporations can spend millions of dollars lobbying for their policies. And you know, the public doesn't have that. So Ralph Nader, he did a speaking tour, inspired a bunch of students. They volunteered their time and started these like campus organizations. The fund grew out of that when money started to get involved. So eventually, you know, they had been going around doing just community organizing, just knocking on doors and talking to people. At some point somebody said, you know what? I bet if we ask people for money when we knocked on their door, some of them would chip something in. Like people believe in this stuff. They have some money, they could probably contribute to it and we could actually grow this thing and and do something with it. Good idea, but it turns out once you add money to the mixture, things start to get more complicated and it's not just a purely volunteer organization anymore. So like one of the things that Becomes hierarchical then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things that came out of the class action lawsuits earlier was that uh, they had been running their Canvas office as if it was still kind of volunteer. Like if you were making quota, like if you were raising enough money, then they would pay you. And if you weren't raising enough money, you wouldn't get paid. That meant that they could just kind of let anybody whose heart was in the right place and who wanted to go talk to people do it because they didn't have to worry about paying them if they didn't do a good job. Uh, It turns out that if you're hiring people to work for you and not paying them, you're in trouble with the law and that kind of created problems for them. And so they had to change their policies. Okay, like, turns out we're actually, you know, running what is a nonprofit but corporation still and we have to abide by the law. We have to pay people that are working for us. So now policies get to where it's like, okay, we can't just let anybody do this. You have to prove that you can do it. You have to raise enough money every day. And slowly but surely that builds into a big machine where money is the focus of the fundraising arm. The groups that we're raising money for, their focus is always on the issues. But in the fund, it starts to be, you know, if you're not raising money, that's all that matters. Whereas early on, it's kind of volunteer based. It's just the only thing that matters is where your heart is and if you care about the issues. And so in a lot of ways, they still, because the folks who run it have been there from the beginning, think of themselves as a kind of volunteer organization and they're paying us out of the goodness of their heart. It's like, we're there doing this work because we believe in it and 
you know, bully for us that they pay us. That's super awesome. That's just like a bonus that we get for doing this work that we should be doing anyway because it's the right thing. It's a bonus you can feed your kids. Right, right, yeah. right. Exactly. 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 And so, so when it's like so. students who have a, a big safety net because they're in the campus, like they've got a food program, they've got a bunch of loans, they're paying for their rent, they're paying for their food, like, you know, if they're getting paid, you know, that's just like money that they can spend on, on going out and have fun on the weekend. But we're not in that model anymore. We're not just on the campus. Like the people that are doing this job, like a lot of them, you know, have kids. They're living in Portland, supporting themselves. You know, the economy isn't the best that it's ever been. Like it is a part time job, but a lot of people are actually supporting themselves on it. And mm -hmm. they haven't quite like revamped their model to acknowledge that reality. They're still yeah. working as if it's a bunch of student mm -hmm. campus volunteers. And on campus, like, you know, there's an Osberg office at U of O. They operate that way. Totally cool. Like, you've got a bunch of students who want to volunteer their time. Awesome. Like, teach them how to do this. Teach them how to organize. Teach them how to get out and get the public involved. But if you're going to be running this in a city where people are actually surviving off of what you're doing, you have to take responsibility for the folks that are spending, you know, 30, close to 40 hours of their week working for you. All right. Well, Eddie, the uh, the uh, rally today, was that what that was all about, to bring these folks up to date? Absolutely. So uh, this week marks, uh, we have been unionized since last October. So this was our 11th negotiation session today, this morning. And so we had uh, well over 100, close to 150 people uh, showed up um, at 6th and Morrison in Southeast, right outside our office today. And it was, uh, it was a great event, uh, a lot of solidarity in the community, a lot of different uh, union groups, um, a lot of people really fired up and that have our back and that agree that, you know, a progressive organization should really, you know, move forward with its ideals and, you know, not, not lose focus of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was hoping maybe we could get some of that footage up here to play behind us. We'll see if the, the, uh, the VTR operator can do that because, you know, there was... You know, there was it was a typical union event with a you know, lot, very loud, very local, vocal, mm -hmm. a lot of chanting and uh, a lot of folks from different unions. I've seen uh, somebody from what the local uh, it was a big big wig from some local organization. Oh, uh, you, uh, Tom, Tom, Tom Chamberlain, Chamberlain was the there, right? yeah, as well as the as uh, the president of the CWA mm -hmm. was there, uh, Madeline Elders mm -hmm. and you know Don uh, McIntosh, who's the writer for the uh, Labor Notes, was there. There we go. Yeah, and that's, she, that's, she, Madeline. She, that's Madeline. That's Madeline right there. She's. Uh, I did a quick interview with her, but we just didn't have the time to, to set something up since I shot this at five o'clock. Yeah, and I was down here at five thirty. Yeah. Barbara Butler from Jaws of Justice. Yeah. All right. And Bob Gross from Jaws of Justice. Yeah. Barbara Bird, the Secretary Treasurer of the State AFL CIO. Yeah. Just a little snippet of what was going on. That was happening at 4.15 to 5.30 or so, right on the corner of, what was it, Morrison and, and uh, MLK. Uh, Mor Morrison Grand. and, and uh, Grand. Yeah, Grand. It yeah. becomes MLK further mm -hmm. further north there. And uh, she grabbed a bullhorn and was kind of laying down what was going on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, a large amount of people. And uh, so you've had negotiations. Uh, you're not, you know, threatening to strike or anything so mm -hmm. maybe you don't have demands but you are you are negotiating with some principles you well, want to enact no actually uh and and I, I just one thing i would like to interject because there were 150 plus people there was a count on um but one of the things i think it's really important to to explain on this is we only have 30 people in the bargaining unit 
I mean, it, the, the fact that we are a year out from negotiations, and, and when, when we first sat down to negotiations, there were um, several of us that uh, spent uh, all our free time for weeks hammering out what we thought was a really good contract, what we thought would be really fair, decent to the fund, because we don't want to hobble what they're doing. We don't want to make things difficult they're for them. They're doing good things. Yeah. Um, we, we, we don't want to hurt that, but we do want some respect. We want some stability. And um, so, so we worked tirelessly to make sure that we had, and we had a 30-page contract uh, a proposal that uh, we handed them. And um, we have been fighting on just those issues for a year. Uh, again, like six hours, arguing direct deposit, you know, because they just don't want to do it. And in fact, uh, you know, at, at one point, uh, Pat's nickname, uh, Pat Wood is, of course, the, uh, uh, the, our, the national TOP director, um, our boss's boss, and um, he's also their negotiator. Uh, we, we started calling him Bartleby the Scrivener because if, if you know the story, it's just basically we'd rather not do that. We'd rather no. I we, would prefer we have, not to. I would prefer not to. We have we have uh, really solid arguments as to why this would work better. Well, why is it up to just one person not to to do it or not to do it? That's uh, not negotiating. That's yeah. Well, that's that's who they sent. This is this is the game they're playing. Um, they sent from national. You from, say? Yeah, from Boston. He he fly he flies out from Boston every month and um of, well not every month. There's been months where he just can't possibly make it because <laughs> too busy. Gee whiz, he's too busy. Yeah, but uh, you know. The, they, they fly, he flies out from Boston, and um, they, they've, they fought tooth and nail for uh, almost eight months to not give us any more than two three-hour sessions a month. Um, then finally, we just became very irate with that and uh, demanded more, and we got three. We got a whole nine hours a month. Uh, it, it's just this sort of, this sort of practice. Um, you know, they, he, he comes in and um, unprepared, in a lot of cases, uh, there have been numerous times he came in and prepared. Um, the the ultimatum issue, uh, we've been arguing that eight months, and um, you know it's consistently a we're gonna uh, we'll come back next month. We'll we'll close out this ultimatum thing next month, and then next month rolls around. Well, we're still not ready to, to make progress on that. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's I mean it's blatant stalling. Mm -hmm. it's it really is. It's blatant stalling. Yeah. Well, and actually refusal to discuss issues. So like. One of the big things that we were talking about at the, the March day is just cause and grievance procedure. Like if you're going to discipline someone or fire them, we want it to be possible for that person to say, hey, I don't think this is just, I want you know a third party to look at this and have an objective viewpoint. Let's review that. Like this is sort of super boilerplate. Like if you're unionizing a yeah, like, independent is. grievance mm -hmm. procedure, this is not so crazy to ask for. So that was in the contract from the absolute beginning, it's a total core issue, and they flat out refuse to discuss that in any way today. They're like, it's been there for a year. Um, we offered them uh, last negotiating meeting to accept where they're at with Ultimatum. We're like, we're really close enough. Like, it's not exactly what we wanted at the beginning. This is a pretty big concession on our part. But as long as you can, you know, cooperate with us and move forward, let's actually, you know, make a deal. Um, all we're really asking for, like, give us just cause grievance procedure, we'll work with you on ultimatum. And today they said, yeah, we've got concerns about having a grievance procedure, but we're not prepared to discuss that at all. And it's like, it's been there for a year. If you've got issues with it, you've had enough time to think about that. You should be able to articulate what your concerns are. Like, that's really not that much to ask. If you have concerns, let us know what they are. Like, really? Is that totally crazy I don't know well how about the national do they have grievance procedures do they uh, this is all nonprofit organization right? yeah 501 c3 right. you know it's 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 uh, the other thing that's um, uh, I think kind of important to, is there there are three call centers uh, the the telephone outreach projects throughout the country um, one based in Sacramento which was where they moved the, the call center after they killed the LA office, um, and then if there's one in Boston that's actually very small, probably only about ten callers, and then there's us in Portland. Um, only Portland, we, the Portland TOP is the only, uh, the only union fight going on right now. Um, the, you know, s this this does not affect Sacramento. It does not affect Boston. Um, it would it would be nice if if they received the same things we did. You know, when this is done, but you know, having said that, they don't have to put up with. Uh, 
you know, being threatened and coerced at work or, you know, they're, they're not having to fight the fight we're fighting. Um, and and that's, that's exactly how it's been. Um, you know, we, we actually have a, a ULP uh, that, that uh, unfair, labor unfair labor practice that was assigned by the uh, the NLRB in our favor, the National Labor Relations Board, that uh, they have threatened and coerced people for uh, involving themselves in the union. Um, we have that's against uh, the law. Uh, it's totally against the law. Um, and out. and <laughs> they uh, they of Oops. course you know said no no we didn't do this but the NLRB said uh, yeah actually you did the the national government came in and said yeah you did and um, the uh, so they presented a. Um, a, uh, a settlement with it to us, uh, their their lawyers, the funds lawyers presented a settlement that said, well, we accept no responsibility for having done this, but we'll make sure it doesn't happen again, uh, which we had to tell them today we refuse to take because just last Wednesday night, the director threatened the exact same girl that he'd threatened in the first propo in the, in the first uh, ULP, you know, if you testify against me in this hearing, uh, I'll fire you. It's 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 just ridiculous strong arm tactics. Uh, People need to be carrying their uh, cell phones yeah, yeah, and yeah. hit record. Well, the, the, <laughs> the, the new, new policy that we've been stated is you don't talk to a director without witnesses. You just don't. I mean, we we you know we would like it if that didn't have to be the case, but you mm -hmm. know we cannot. We just do not trust what they say anymore mm -hmm. uh, because of, of this. Uh, the and what? then the, the sheer number of firings um, that that are highly, highly questionable. So those four people that were assigned to do negotiating, uh, one woman uh, got fired. How many of the other three sure. remained? Uh, <laughs> I was the last, and I was fired on So November. all four have disappeared mm -hmm. that have yeah. been unionized. And, uh, well, Isn't the, that against the law? Of Even the originals? Uh, well, <laughs> you gotta not exactly against the, the law. Because so, they'll so, say some other reason. Right. So, sure. So sure, sure. It's always, you know, sort of questionable whether people were fired for organizing with the union or anything else. Um, so far, they've fired six people mm -hmm. that have been on the negotiation um, team at various points. Right. Um, David is number six to be fired of the original four. He was the last. You know, we've got four on the negotiating team at this point. We all know that we've got giant targets painted on our backs. And so, you know, we have to, you know, play it straight and do everything absolutely by the book and keep a smile on our face and, you know, come in and do our job and fight for these causes because that's what we believe in. So, but we all know that, you know, there's a history of firing negotiators and mm -hmm. we're out there risking our necks to, to stand up mm -hmm. for our fellow callers and, and ask for these things. So, all right. Sure. Well, you know, the reason why we, we bring folks on to talk about these issues is because viewers can maybe weigh in on this. Mm -hmm. And so, so we talked about this, Eddie, before the, the program. There's a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you remember what that was? Yeah, it's um, T.O.P. Unite. I'm um, thinking so we have a lot of uh, followers. We actually organized uh, one of the, the protests today uh, through that. So. Folks can check out updates that way. On Facebook, um, that would be, go to Facebook. That's right. Uh, hopefully they got that up on the graphic. Okay, but yeah. if not, it's pretty simple, T.O.P. Unite. Yeah, Unite. Por Portland, Portland, T.O.P. Portland, Unite. Unite. That's right, yep. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, that is one way to do it, but I'm just wondering, uh, uh, some of the some of the uh, nonprofits that you folks uh, call to support, uh, what are some of those? If folks out there happen to belong to those organizations, they could maybe make you know, uh, uh, make it be known that they believe that uh, the, you folks need a union. Right. So, so what are some of the uh, organizations you call for, or, or can that be a, a way to do oh, it? Oh, abs absolutely. And one of the things that we've consistently said, because we do believe in what these groups are doing, and, and truth be told, uh, the groups themselves don't have uh, any direct decision making in this. This really is the fund for the public interest that we have a fight with. Um, having said that, if uh, I had uh, a nonprofit, the David nonprofit, and you were f doing my fundraising, but you were treating your, my employees terribly, and I contracted you. I, I would be able to say something about it. I would That's have what the I'm biggest hoping. voice <laughs> on that. So uh, you know, certainly within um, within the state of Oregon, uh, it's Environment Oregon and Osberg O S P I R G. Uh, both have web pages, um, and um, in Washington, it's uh, Washburg and Environment Washington. Uh, it really, whatever state you're dealing with, it really is. There's an environment, name that state, and there's a name that state P I R G, um, and uh, emailing those people, the executive directors, which is it's all on their web page. E emailing those people, uh, calling those people, those directors, and saying this is unacceptable to me. 
Um, we are not encouraging people to defund. Uh, we do not want people to pull their support. That doesn't help us as individual callers. Uh, it doesn't help the union progress. Um, and it certainly doesn't help the groups win these fights. But uh, they care. I mean, I, I, li I like to still believe that these groups care what their members think. And uh, if enough members were to call in and say, like, this is not okay, you know, this is not what I expect out of a progressive organization, then they can put some pressure on the fund to actually close this out. I mean, it won't happen until then, obviously. No, no, and that's and that's uh, honestly the biggest the biggest issue we've run into this is we've stood firm on that floor. Uh, we have um, you know done what we were supposed to do, and and, and uh, we fought this battle in negotiations and we fought it through concerted activities like the one we had today. Um, but we need we need pressure from the outside. We need members to actually express their views and their distaste for this sort of behavior mm -hmm. to, to the member groups. So the member groups can put pressure on the fund to just close this out. Uh, we get a contract, uh, we need, you know, we have just cause, we have grievance, we have, you know, pay stability and, and some job security. And, and we go back to not having an issue. Because uh, we have a contract we can, we can work under. It sounds like you're just asking for what any, any worker, union or non-union, would expect from his, from his labor. Mm -hmm. Now you're still working there. That's right. Yeah, Bern and I are both uh, both currently employed. We're both union negotiators on the committee, so we sit across the table from Pat Wood, the national director, along with two others, and we have that conversation as small just as it can be, um, and try to move forward on parsing out the language. But was that the yeah. fellow that was in the restaurant today? It was. <laughs> that yeah. is the fellow that was mm -hmm. in the cafe today. He, so the fellow that did bring the viewers up. The, uh, there was a fellow in the cafe, and a bunch of folks wandered in off the street. And uh, Tom Chamberlain, and everybody took a swing at him there. Not literally, but everybody. <laughs> everybody mentioned you know Jobs with Justice, the uh, president of Jobs with Justice. They all told him that our, uh, there are other unions and other organizations that are that are uh, aware of this and that are starting to pay attention. And uh, they want these negotiations to come to a stop mm -hmm. and let you give folks the security that it, they deserve for putting in their mm -hmm. time. And yeah. it seems to me, you know, that, that, that the way they're conducting themselves is, is typical corporate management, even mm -hmm. though it's nonprofit, it's right. typical corporate management policies. They don't want to cede any authority to their workers. Mm -hmm. it really, I mean, it, it, one of the things that is uh, stuck in um, my crop personally, uh, when when I was first approached about uh, the union and involvement in the union way back in the summer of uh, 2011, um, uh, I, had a, I had a good conversation with my parents. Um, you know, I've always been pro-labor and basically, uh, but, but in an esoteric way. It didn't actually really affect me. Pretty and abstract. Yeah, <laughs> very abstract. And, um, you know, I, uh, in that discussion with my parents, really came to... to or to, to real resolution that it's like if you believe in something you stand for something but then out of fear uh, of retaliation you don't fight for it when it knocks on your door then you really are just a coward and well, I, won't, I won't be that um, and also that it's really the right thing to fight for uh, because it's just calling this group on its hypocrisy um, now I really did not think at that point that we would still be fighting this um, but I was very aware that if they do, I will be needing a, another job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will be looking for a different job. Um, this is a bad job market right now. Oh, yeah. It's, well, you know, the, the reality is there, you know, in, in my case, as in we are the hiring, case of by other the people. Way. Yeah, by the way, we're hiring. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> there you go, folks. My seat's empty. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, they're, 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 uh, we're, we're taking avenues. I mean, there's definitely ULP being filed on this, um, you know. Be, because it was very much for for you, you know, take your grievances somewhere else. Sure, they won't give you a grievance policy there. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the the, the reality is, as uh, as as difficult as this is, um, we have been incredibly lucky. I mean, uh, Joe Crane, Madeline Elder, uh, they've really fought for us. They have really, really been there uh, to to help us with this. She's um, a bar brand. I, I, I love Madeline. <laughs> She's great. I love Madeline. And mm -hmm. um, you know, then also the uh, you know uh, Tom Chamberlain has just been. I um, mean, when when he first found out that uh, that I had been fired, 
uh, we've met an, uh, just a, a handful of times, but he knew exactly who I was and was personally outraged. So, uh, you know, really there's been a tremendous amount of support from the community, which really culminated tonight. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. that was a huge. Well, I saw Jimmy Partridge in the Postal Union mm -hmm. that it was, it was there, and, and mm -hmm. he's always going to be supporting. Yeah. There's folks that are always going to support unions, and there's always folks that, that are going to think that unions, I don't know how they can feel that way, but that unions are not yeah. our right. You know, collective bargaining is not a right. Well, you know, I'm, ask Scott Walker in Wisconsin when he just took that away from his people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the federal government disagrees. Unions uh, and the ability to participate in unions is a right. Uh, I mean, that's that's that is a right. And, you know, mm -hmm. traditionally, it's the hyper right wing that is arguing mm -hmm. against the you know right to unionize and and pushing against it in every way they can. And every now and then, like sitting in negotiations, you get flashbacks to the the Bush administration. Yeah. And, it's it's kind of like okay, are are we actually talking to a progressive group or are we talking to a right wing ideologue? Like I'm confused. Who am I yeah, dealing with? Or, yeah. or another country like Colombia, who you know kicks their injured workers to the curb, mm -hmm. on, and, and and various nations around the world that uh, there's no such thing as a union. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're we're lucky to live in a nation where we actually can like come together mm -hmm. and say that you know we want to be represented by people yeah. from our peers to go and talk to management like that that's possible it's really awesome that uh you know that i haven't been fired just for representing my peers is great mm -hmm. yeah fantastic mm -hmm. let's keep mm -hmm. it that way let's keep it that way so just just to kind of underline it all we got like less than five minutes here what exactly are you other than wanting to take money you know put money directly into your bank um forget the term you use for that but but uh, what are some of the things that you're asking for well, um, you know, in interestingly enough, uh, when when um, when we actually wrote the contract, we did ask for uh, pay raises, but we also made very clear to them within the first two negotiating sessions the only raise we actually want to see and that we're we're willing to fight for is for uh, the administrative assistants. Um, they're basically paid minimum wage with. N no matter how long they've been there, there's no recourse for them to receive performance raises. So we felt that that's kind of wrong. You know, uh, Carr uh, Mankey has uh, been there for two years and is still making minimum wage. I mean, he's got a little kid. I mean, this we should he should really be appreciated for the loyalty he's shown uh, the fund. Um, but but yeah, it's it really is. It's not about pay uh, about uh, pay increase. It's really about job stability. Uh, making sure that people aren't getting fired on a whim, making sure that people aren't getting fired within you know a very few short weeks. Um, it's about you know um, pay stability, uh, making sure that you know you can't lose a third of your income overnight just because you have a bad run, because that happens. I mean, it just happens. You can be the best caller, and you're still gonna you're gonna hit bad nights. You're gonna hit bad runs, um, and and uh, that that's not it's not right. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know just cause agreements. It really does come down to you know that those three things is exactly what we fought on in every policy that we address in, in that uh, that contract proposal we have. Really does come back down to one of those three things. One of those three things, and you're also in a also in a, in a saturated job market where there's a lot more people looking for work than there are jobs. Plus the the economy's gone to hell too. So yeah. that is that both of those are working against you. There's mm -hmm. probably you know, I know a friend of mine was just looking at a job today, and it was, you know, like scores of people, uh, I forget, it's maybe, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that were sign showing up to for just a handful of jobs for Christmas for Christmas help. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be down to about two and a half minutes. I know we can't get a word in edgewise with Eddie here, so I'll give him, <laughs> <laughs> I give him a chance. So what would you like to see happen? Well, uh, just getting back to what we're fighting for, what this boils down to is basic dignity and respect uh, yeah. no worker well should be mm -hmm. should uh, no worker's head should be on the chopping block constantly always two weeks away from being fired regardless of showing up to work um, rested and with a full heart ready to talk to a bunch of people across the country and engage with them on these issues uh, we feel that yeah no worker should be in a position where they're constantly just fighting to keep their head above water um, as as good as they're performing or not so what this boils down to is, I mean, the ultimatum structure, a lot of their policies are very humiliating and uh, we just feel that, you know, we should show up and if, we, if you uh, perform well and um, you're, you're a good worker, you should be rewarded with some just basic stability and security. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's just all about, uh, you know, 
it's unfortunate that they don't realize uh, it's in their best interest to have a... In the long run, it would be. Yeah, yeah because we would be raising more money and we'd be more focused on engaging with people and not distracted from all the other, uh, the noise, if you will, that exists, mm -hmm. but yeah. I, I guess you should be mentioned, even though we only got a little over a minute left, is you, know, you guys show up to work, guys or girls show up to work, they give you a list of names, you know, they could be good names, it could be bad names. You yeah. have no control yeah. over who it is you're calling. Exactly. That's a whole nother yeah, that's, that's, of I know, I, I we, thought, of, I thought about that. time to talk about <laughs> that. I thought about that man, late. We, we could do another show just about that. But so, like, if you want to talk for 40 minutes about how the actual back end of this job works, like yeah, yeah. maybe we'll do that next time. But uh, that, that should be mentioned, the fact that, you know, it isn't necessarily whether you're good or not, it's who you're calling.